Hi students, today we will be discussing a very important chapter that is water balance. Now this chapter may or may not be taught in your classroom due to lack of time but this is very important because it is listed in the competencies okay it comes under biochemistry competency 6.7 okay here you can see uh, water and electrolyte balance it should be taught in relation to pH but this often is neglected or you may be uh, taught this in SDL that is self-directed learning classes but this is very important fundamental chapter regarding which concept should be absolutely clear for both first year students as well as students who are preparing for NEET PG exam as well as postgraduate students of various disciplines medicine, biochemistry, pathology, pediatrics, surgery, what not anyway. So, in today's class, we will be focusing on these learning objectives. So, after the class is over, after the whole session is over, you should be able to outline the body water contents and their composition, state whether, what's the terms of water based on input, output, what's the role of water in these uh, departments. Next, we should be able to define osmolality of the ECF we should be able to confidently now answer the electrolyte composition of body fluids next the regulation of sodium and water balance by ras system that is renin angiotensin system next we should be able to classify derangements in body fluid and electrolyte balance in terms of tonicity that is osmolarity and lastly we should be able to list the causes of isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic contraction that is dehydration and expansion that is over hydration of extra cellular fluid now before going forward i should warn you or you must have seen it by now that the duration of this lecture is quite huge okay this is a part of regular lecture not your very short online video so feel free to give yourself a break get back some composure and then again restart from the point where you left okay it's not mandatory then to watch this whole session in one go but everything that i will be discussing here is very 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 <laughs> important now we will start with the basics and then we will move forward to more complicated areas the first thing that's total body water okay based on an average body weight okay if we consider 60 percent of an average body weight it comes to around 42 liters so 70 kg <laughs> male okay six sevens are 42 so Better you can uh, forget to, I mean choose to forget the exact liter, okay, because it will vary from patient to patient. Better to remain, I mean remember the exact percentage. So total body weight, 60% will be water. From that, 40% will be intracellular and 20% will be your extracellular body weight. And from the 20%, intravascular will be 4% and extravascular will be 16 percent so remember these may come as an mcq direct mcq they will give you the body weight of the any case and they will simply ask you the intravascular fluid volume is you need to calculate the math and then answer the correct option right so this is a very important question for mcq moving forward the basically the water balance in our body the intake output per day you can look at this chart now for all the charts that i'll be showing over here it's advised that you either pause this take a screenshot make your own notes because these are facts these are data there is nothing much to understand so you can simply copy them i'll not be wasting my time reading these charts right but i'll definitely focus on something if that's important specifically so this is something you need to remember next the factors that are controlling water balance in the body these are important they will be asked in viva or they may be asked in short notes long question anything so the major fa factors that are controlling now see most of these you can answer from your common sense from your plus two knowledge or even knowledge of nutrition from class seven eight etc right so major factors that are controlling fluid intake are thirst right and rate of metabolism the more the thirst you will drink more water more metabolism we need more water now the thirst intake is stimuli stimulated by increase in osmolality of blood leading to increased intake 
very important gfr that is glomerular filtration rate or simply renal function is one of major controlling factor for the rate of output right next insensible perspiration very important either it can be sweating or insensible means you can feel water is going out through skin in case of very hot and humid climate or the thing that you don't feel but still water is being lost is known as insensible perspiration now those thing will vary from climate to climate it will be very high in tropical humid and it will be very low in cold <laughs> climate next rough water very important this is important mcq or viva question loss of water through screen is increased to 13% for each degree rise in centigrade in the body temperature during fever very important that's why during fever it is always advised to have or to uh, suggest or to prescribe huge amount of fluid replacement you should drink plenty of water when you are having high fever next we come to another chart that is the amount of uh, electrolytes in various type of gastrointestinal secretion uh, this may not be asked directly to a first year student right because remembering these all numbers are very complicated but should should have a rough idea where you get more sodium and where you get more potassium right and the value of chloride this is more important for mcq purpose if you are preparing for neat pg exam over there you know you need to remember a lot of things and simply they will ask the concentration of potassium in bile <laughs> right then you need to mark the correct option so being a first year student you can choose to skip this slide and move on to more conceptual uh, slides however this is important you see gamble gram this type of composite bar diagram that shows uh, various percentages of various electrolytes is known as gamble gram if uh, you find it a bit complicated you have got a chart for you right now this chart has been taken from the standard textbook of vasudevan okay i'm not referring to any complicated textbooks over here so you can find this chart in your textbook of vasudevan and you can note few important things number 1 sodium and potassium these are most important and chloride and bicarbonate these four are must know because these are the electrolytes that we often order for any patient in icu sodium potassium chloride and bicarbonate right others are also important but in very specific cases in general you should know sodium potassium chloride and bicarbonate if the patient has got any symptoms of hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia then only we need to order or enquire the specific electrolytes like calcium magnesium similarly in case of phosphate etc one more important thing that is total protein that should also be your matter of concern but when you are referring to electrolytes sodium potassium chloride and bicarbonate are the most important ones next why do we pay so much importance to sodium because that is the most important solute particle that determines the serum osmolality right therefore we can easily say that sodium and water balance are dependent on each other and cannot be considered separately sodium and water run side by side if we regulate if we can regulate one we will regulate the other and if we cannot regulate the one we cannot regulate the other they both run hand in hand and the organ that maintains a tight regulation of both of them are definitely the kidneys right so whenever kidneys need to regulate water they excrete or reabsorb water in form of urine and when they need to regulate solute kidney can very well control the metabolism of sodium so remember the most important electrolyte that determines water balance is na plus or sodium now let's uh, get over with the fundamental definitions which most of you might be knowing osmolarity and osmolality right there are two different terms so osmolarity when there is a r okay remember number of moles of solute 
per liter of solution so volume remember osmolar dt has an r so you can remember by this r right now what is osmolar dt osmolar dt definitely deals with kg right the mass so number of osmoles of solute per kg of solvent this is the fundamental difference between the two units osmolar dt and osmolar dt however mind it in our medical terminologies or references we often use osmolar dt okay mainly osmoles per liter okay so these are determined by solute that is electrolytes and i have just told you the most important electrolyte that will determine is na plus or uh, sodium so now we go to osmolar dt which is our matter of uh, concern so i told you plasma that is the extracellular fluid it is mainly contributed by na plus sodium however intracellular fluid is mainly contributed by potassium why you have already seen in case of intracellular fluid it is the potassium which is most highest in concentration you can see intracellular fluid the major part this whole yellow is made by k plus whereas in interstitial or intracellular fluid or even plasma sodium rules okay so whenever we are dealing with the intracellular osmolarity that is icf we are mainly concerned about potassium however for all practical purposes we consider plasma osmolarity right so plasma osmolarity what is the formula 2 multiplied by sodium plus 2 multiplied by potassium plus urea plus glucose we consider everything right and that gives us the value of plasma osmolarity now note this this formula might be very passable for first year students but you need to know the exact formula the exact formula is a bit uh, complex you know uh, it's actually 2 into sodium plus potassium plus glucose by 18 plus blood urea nitrogen by 2.8 now what is blood urea nitrogen blood urea nitrogen has a relation with urea that is uh, 10 i mean <laughs> blood urea nitrogen 10 mg per deciliter is approximately 21.4 mg per deciliter of urea right so in general you can say it's a sum of twice the sodium potassium and urea and glucose but the urea and glucose are not the whole amount it's a fraction so glucose by 18 and blood urea nitrogen by 2.8 and you need to convert urea to bun <laughs> right that is you need to divide it by 2.4 anyway you don't get into complication if you are a first year student but for pg student and for those who are appearing for neat pg you definitely need to know this formula because values will be given and from there you need to calculate your osmolality value calculating everything the normal reference range as i told you comes out to be 285 to 295 milli osmol per kg since we are dealing with osmolality okay now you can see the osmolality of plasma as i told you mainly determined by sodium with an ions 92% the rest contribute to 8% that is everything else potassium calcium magnesium urea glucose they are very minor so even if you omit glucose sodium potassium even if you omit the fraction it hardly matters because mainly it's sodium sodium <laughs> sodium right now there is a factor known as osmolar gap what is that it is much like anion gap if you have gone through the chapter of uh, ph and buffer acidosis alkalosis it's actually a difference between measured osmolarity and calculated osmolality right so there is a part that is unmeasured osmolality that is known as osmolar gap and it happens due to compounds like ethanol mannitol neutral and various other cationic amino acids that are present remember when we are discussing anion gap we already told you that that part is also due to presence of unmeasured anions like protein albumin etc so remember there is an entity like osmolar gap which acts very similar to anion gap due to the presence of these unmeasured compounds or factors that contribute very minor to the overall osmolality of a plasma now what is effective osmolality again another important term till now we were discussing 
total osmolality right now effective means its term used for those extracellular solutes that determine water movement across the cell membrane ultimate role of this osmolality is to determine whether where water will move whether it will move from ecf to icf or there will be movement of water from icf to ecf because an imbalance will result in hydration dehydration <laughs> or overhydration so it means the solutes that are freely permeable such as urea alcohol etc they can enter into the cell freely to achieve an osmotic equilibrium there will be no necessity for movement of water is it clear just know this although there is an increase in osmolality there is no shift in water because they are eventually trying to achieve osmolar equilibrium so effective osmolarity is increased from outside to inside due to movement of solutes but still there is no shift in water remember in any of this discussion if i ever sound like pronouncing osmolarity it's actually osmolality right everything is osmolality so i'm sorry for my mispronunciation uh, so far and henceforth but always consider osmolality unless otherwise specifically mentioned however on the other hand if there are few impermeable solutes like glucose mannitol etc they need their special membrane receptors if they are present in extracellular fluid water what happens they have to move to compensate these unbalanced solutes so they have to move from icf to ecf and extracellular osmolality will be increased so mind it impermeable solutes like glucose and mannitol will always increase extracellular osmolality and that is one important therapeutic role of mannitol which we use to treat cerebral edema that is the brain cells if they are edematous we infuse mannitol so that fluid will get out of the cell membrane so you need to remember this formula for every 100 mg per dl increase in glucose 1 and 1 1.5 millimole per liter of sodium is reduced this is the direct formula of sodium and glucose and this phenomena is actually known as dilutional hyponatremia we will be discussing it in further detail when we will be discussing electrolyte imbalance in electrolyte balance or imbalance in our future classes hence sodium plasma sodium is a reliable index of total and effective osmolality in normal and clinical conditions so again and again i am highlighting one very important factor that sodium is the ultimate determinant of osmolality whether it is total or whether it's effective now till now we were discussing various ions those are crystals crystalloids right so crystalloids and water can easily diffuse across membranes but the osmotic gradient that is the osmotic motive force the change in osmolality due to which water needs to move that force is actually provided by non diffusible colloidal protein particles extremely important the colloidal osmotic pressure this is a term exerted by proteins and they are the major factors which maintains the intravascular and extravascular fluid compartments otherwise there should have everything should have been same right there is a reason why those two are different the percentages are different i showed you in the first slide and that is mainly determined by proteins because they are non diffusible and they are colloid what will happen if this gradient is reduced the fluid will extravasate means excess fluid will come out and they will accumulate in the interstitial space leading to edema right we never want that and hence uh, this is one part of the story if there is a volume depletion we infuse colloid so that the volume is made up okay now that's an applied part but just know this main vascular osmolality as well as interstitial osmolality is maintained by non diffusible colloidal particles so you can see the total osmotic pressure is 5000 mm of hg among them if this hypothetical value the effective osmotic pressure will be 25 and mainly they are determined by protein so 80% will be determined by albumin and 20% will be determined by 
globulin okay so you see here is the ultimate figure everything has been determined so it varies from arterial end to the venous end of a capillary and that determines whether fluid will be i mean blood will be going inside or it will be going outside the capillary so it varies from arterial end to venous end generally in arterial end you can see there's an effective outward osmotic pressure of 10 millimeter whereas in venous end there will be an effective inward osmotic pressure of 10 millimeter of mercury so let's summarize what we have studied till now at equilibrium the osmolality of ecf and icf are identical remember at equilibrium right next solute content of icf is very constant it cannot change intracellular environment should be fixed the entropy is very low over there everything is in order right it's not chaotic next sodium is retained only in extracellular fluid next point total body solute divided by total body water gives the body fluid osmolality very important next total intracellular solute divided by plasma osmolality will be equal to the intracellular volume you can calculate all this this is nothing complex next we move on to various hormones that help in regulating this water balance so what are they they are aldosterone ras system that is renin angiotensin system antidiuretic hormone and atrial natriuretic peptides or ANP. So let's look at them one by one. So first aldosterone is a mineralocorticoid secreted by zona glomerulosa of adrenal cortex. The main function is it causes sodium reabsorption from renal tubules. So if aldosterone is very high, sodium excretion will be low. However, it will help in excretion of potassium and hydrogen ion. So there is an exchange, ion exchange that happens at the level of kidneys. So they will reabsorb, retain sodium in exchange of potassium and hydrogen. So this is how the sodium balance is actually controlled by aldosterone. Whenever body need to retain sodium, definitely there will be more secretion of aldosterone which is governed by more secretion of angiotensin 2 which is governed by angiotensin 1 which in turn is governed by secretion of angiotensinogen and which is controlled by secretion of renin so this is a complete feedback loop so renin more angiotensinogen more angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 it helps in secretion of aldosterone so you can see thick thick arrows and they will help in retention of sodium so sodium is excreted very less however potassium is excreted much more however what if the body needs to and this actually this response is essential in maintaining blood pressure when the bp is falling so this is a emergency response when there is a falling bp kidneys and i mean system will try to retain sodium however in case of the exact opposite scenario in case of increased blood pressure body needs to lose sodium then everything the secretion will be decreased so everything is in very thin arrow it means there is a negligible role of ras system so kidneys will have the freedom to excrete profuse amount of sodium and by that mechanism the bp will fall so this is basically reciprocal regulation how aldosterone controls blood pressure next we see adh antidiuretic hormone now diuresis means excretion of urine right antidiuretic hormone by the name it suggests it suppresses urine more adh means less urine remember this fundamental concept this is also known as vasopressin because it has got a vasoconstrictor action it is secreted from posterior pituitary what happens whenever there is high plasma osmolality right there is stimulation of osmoreceptors that's the receptors that can sense the change in plasma osmolality of hypothalamus this causes release of adh it increases water reabsorption by dct and collecting tubule distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct remember high plasma osmolality means plasma is concentrated solutes are more water is less so we need to conserve water therefore adh will now say 
I mean now command the system that we need more water so please excrete less water and there will be anti diuresis there will be no diuresis there will be less urine production and thus osmolarity will rise so 1% rise in osmolarity triggers ADH production which increases renal reabsorption of water right very important 1% is very sensitive response is also affected by volume loss in case there is a volume loss due to either burns or hemorrhage in that case also the system will be activated to conserve maximum amount of fluid so this is the regulation diagrammatic representation you can see whenever solutes are more that is plasma is concentrated there will be excess secretion of adh by thick lines and there will be scanty urine production at the level of kidneys right and whenever plasma is diluted that is very low amount of solute there is over hydration then the adh value will lower and kidneys are now free to excrete profuse amount of urine and balance the situation so see this is the basic uh, diagram of renin angiotensin and aldosterone system so what how is it controlled there should be a drop in blood pressure kidney sense that and they release renin from liver angiotensinogen is synthesized renin acts on angiotensinogen and it produces angiotensin 1 this angiotensin 1 is not active what is active angiotensin 2 this needs an activating enzyme that is known as angiotensin converting enzyme ace that is again secreted from the lungs so when angiotensin 2 is secreted it will have an action at three level number 1 it will trigger hypothalamus it will send signal to hypothalamus and they will increased thirst and secretion of adh what will happen there will be increase in ecf volume next it directly has got a role in vascular system you see heart and vascular system so vasoconstriction whenever there is vasoconstriction then again and next adrenal cortex will help stimulation of i mean secretion of aldosterone and they will help in salt and water retention so together all of them will now act for a common goal that is elevation of blood pressure so we started in fall in bp and now we end in rise in bp so this is the natural mechanism that is built in our body by which blood pressure water is regulated next a very important thing renin and renin are different you can see one has got double n <laughs> so what are they our system today what we are discussing we are concerned about renin so kidney secrete renin it's help it helps in body fluid maintenance and hypertension regulation right renin r e double n i n is actually a proteolytic enzyme that is seen in gastric juice especially in children so remember whenever whenever we are discussing renin angiotensin aldosterone is a single and not double n that's a misnomer so uh, let's highlight over here again uh, these are the proteolytic enzyme that helps in ultimately production of angiotensin 1 and 2 so what is happening angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1 by renin okay angiotensin no gen contains 453 amino acid and angiotensin is a much degraded part active but degraded it contains only 10 amino acid angiotensin 1 is converted by ace this is angiotensin converting enzyme to angiotensin 2 which has got 8 amino acid i didn't discuss here but remember angiotensin 2 can also be converted to angiotensin 3 by amino peptidase and angiotensin 2 and 3 is finally degraded by angiotensin a so these are basically degradation product of hormones that may or may not be asked to a first year student but for pg student they are very important for first year student knowing these two will suffice from angiotensinogen to angiotensin 2 if you know ace2 you are done next we move on to the role of angiotensin converting enzyme right and its inhibitors that is antagonists right so angiotensin converting enzyme ace you saw is a glycoprotein that is present in the lung right 
the inhibitors of angiotensin converting enzyme that is ace inhibitors or ace inhibitors are useful in treating edema and chronic heart failure that is congestive heart failure very important they are one of the key drugs in treating pedal edema that is leg swelling that happens in congestive heart failure so various peptide analogs of angiotensin uh, 2 that is sirlastin and antagonists of angiotensin converting enzyme that is captopril very important amipril captopril they are useful in treating renin dependent hypertension this is also known as essential hypertension and most of the cases of hypertension unless proved otherwise are due to this so ace inhibitors or ace inhibitors are one of the very first drug that is prescribed to a case of chronic hypertension be it young or be it elderly and remember angiotensin 1 is inactive and 2 3 are active right the take away message is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors that is ace inhibitors are helpful as an anti hypertensive drug next we move on to natriuretic peptides or anp so they are actually hormones polypeptide in nature they are secreted from right atrium how they are secreted they are stimulated by cardiac stretch they are stimulated by increased cardiac stretch and what they do they help in increasing sodium loss and as a result increases water excretion just imagine why will the heart be stretched when there is hypervolemia when there is excess water in the system now the heart feels it has stretched too much so we need to reduce the volume therefore it stimulates secretion of atrial natriuretic peptide the name suggests natriuretic means sodium excretion so they will now stimulate the kidney or give a signal to kidney to excrete more and more sodium and as i told you sodium and water goes hand in hand and then water will also be excreted and thus volume will be lowered one more thing they also decrease production of aldosterone because aldosterone is doing the opposite thing right one key thing to note for mcq specially that type b natriuretic peptides or bnp is available in prescription form to treat congestive heart failure okay this is one of the new type of drug for treating heart failure that is has become favorite drug of many cardiologists because congestive heart failure is one of the main prevalent diseases of elderly next we move on to thirst well this is a very important factor that maintains fluid and uh, water balance or imbalance now i am thirsty and so let me drink some water excuse me <sighs> sorry for that anyway so water imbalance osmolality has got a very important relation with thirst as i told you 1% increase in osmolality causes thirst right triggered by adh and 5% decrease in volume stimulates thirst so remember whenever you are thirsty either one of these two things have happened but where does uh, how does osmolality increase or how does fluid fluid volume has been lost when you are doing nothing when you are sitting all day still you are feeling thirsty because due insensible perspiration as i told you fluid is always being lost but you cannot sense it anyway lack of access to water or poor thirst is the major cause of hypernatremia very dangerous we will be discussing in detail in our subsequent classes of electrolyte imbalance thirst contributes to hyponatremia in fluid loss edematous states which is triggered by low intravascular volume so let us again look at the salient features of electrolyte imbalance hypoosmolality and hyponatremia go hand in hand if sodium is low osmolality will be low next hypoosmolality causes swelling of cells and hyperosmolality causes dehydration of cells very easy to understand hypoosmolality means there is excess water which has moved inside and it will to swelling and whenever things are concentrated that is hyperosmolar it has been due to the phenomena that water has gone out due to dehydration anyway dilutional hyponatremia 
ड्यू टू ग्लूकोज और मैनीटॉल इंक्रीजेज द इफेक्ट्स ऑफ हाइपर ऑस्मोलालिटी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड फटीग एंड मसल क्रैम्स आर द कॉमन सिम्टम्स ऑफ इलेक्ट्रोलाइट डिप्लीशन वेन एवर यू आर फीलिंग एक्सेस टायर्ड और फटीग और यू आर हैविंग मसल क्रैम्प माइंड इट द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट शुड कम टू योर माइंड देर माइड बी सम प्रॉब्लम इन माई इलेक्ट्रोलाइट्स राइट वेदर एक्चुअली वी डोंट फील दिस वे वेन अ पेशेंट कंप्लेन्स लाइक दिस यू शुड दैट शुड बी द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट शुड ट्रिगर इन योर माइंड नाउ वेन इट कम्स टू पेशेंट्स ऑन फ्लूड्स देर should be a few things that you need to keep it in mind remember they may not apply to us because we are drinking at will patients who are admitted and who are on saline they should be handled with very much, very caution now most of the factors remain same this thing is extra hyponatremia of extracellular fluid causes symptoms when associated with hyperkalemia remember very it's very important you should be able to calibrate the level of potassium when infusing any fluid to admitted patient a tip for interns and those who are going to work to treat patient and uh, this one hypo osmolality of gastrointestinal cells cause nausea vomiting and paralytic ileus a conscious patient will not go to these i mean to this extent whenever we are having some problem we actually drink water and it's sorted out but for patients who are admitted an excess over correction or change in osmolality may lead to these symptoms so these are alarming symptoms regarding which we should be cautious so nausea vomiting is fine paralytic ileus means the gut the lower gut actually uh, remains stagnant and that leads to intestinal obstruction these are complications of electrolyte imbalance so how do we assess the sodium and water balance number one very important you should maintain an intake output chart that is known as i by o chart whenever you go to the wards as a part of your early clinical exposure for first year students you will always see a board that is hanging uh, beside the bed and over there the nursing staff on duty or anybody who is monitoring the patient the physicians will be noting these things number one intake output chart their temperature and their blood pressure so intake output chart is basically assessed from the amount of fluids or saline that is going in as and from the urine output that is uh, collected in the catheter or ure bag and this is specially important in case of febrile patients or patients who are having high fever because they have got a huge loss of water via insensible perspiration after intake output chart comes the measurement of electrolytes so directly we can measure sodium potassium chloride and bicarbonate you remember these are the four electrolytes that i told you to remember from the big chart because assessment of these will give you an exact idea about the excess or depletion or redistribution of water another important thing is measurement of hematocrit value to see if there is hemo concentration or dilution we are not discussing about hematocrit because it will be dealt in details in physiology class however we should also consider the measurement of urinary excretion of electrolytes especially sodium and chloride because that is also a very important determinant of sodium and water balance so we move on to our next section where we'll be dealing with dehydration and overhydration right so dehydration can be due to loss of water alone or it can be due to loss of both sodium and water so based on these it can be classified into three types isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic mind it whenever we are seeing the term contraction it means dehydration right contraction in plasma volume intracellular volume these are known as dehydration now isotonic contraction reason causes due to loss of isotonic fluid that is isotonic fluid with plasma loss of gi fluid via small intestinal fistula obstruction paralytic ileus recovery of renal failure see unless you have you are starting to study medicines all these reasons will not be physiologically clear to you so for now you can just choose to remember any one of them and you will be done right because there is a very interesting physiology 
uh by which you can understand how each of them works i can easily explain but it will be beyond the scope of this lecture and it will go beyond the my intended time and you will be bored anyway so the result of this dehydration is decreased renal blood flow and that will lead to uremia oliguria that is decreased production of urine however plasma sodium level will be normal and in case of severe isotonic contraction patient will land up in hypotension that is bp will fall next we move on to hypotonic dehydration or hypotonic contraction as the name suggest it's mainly due to depletion of sodium because sodium determines the osmolality mainly so what are the reasons it's due to large amount of infusion of iv dextrose that is glucose and also deficiency of aldosterone what happens the hypoosmolality inhibits adh which leads to excessive water loss and ultimately plasma sodium and osmolality is restored and leading to hypoosmolar dehydration right so we see this is the pathology how a hypoosmolar dehydration may happen right next hypotonic contraction next hypertonic contraction it means water depletion without electrolytes so what are the reasons diarrhea vomiting diabetes insipidus very important we'll be discussing diabetes insipidus when we uh, take up adh in more details in future hormone action classes so what happens increased sodium in plasma will lead to increased osmolality and decreased renal flow will lead to aldosterone secretion and it will lead to further sodium retention and hypertension <laughs> and this will lead to number one definitely is dehydration but still there is sodium retention so hypertonic dehydration so these are the features of extracellular fluid compartment depletion so what happens increased pulse rate that is dehydration dry mucous membrane soft sunken eyeballs decreased skin turgor it means whenever you pinch a skin normally it should go back to its original state however in case of severe dehydration if you pinch a skin it will remain pinched the conformation it will very slowly go back normally finally it will lead to decreased consciousness patient may be semi comatosed there will be decreased urine output and there will be postural decrease in bp all these will indicate that there is some problem and there is low extracellular fluid volume these are the basic features of dehydration which you should look in a patient if you suspect dehydration or if you get these features and signs in a patient you should always suspect <laughs> dehydration next what is the treatment of dehydration simple oral supply of water there is water deficiency first you need to correct water however you may need you may need to assess whether the variety is hypotonic or hypertonic based on that you should be able to modify so administration of 5% dextrose for those unconscious patient who cannot drink water orally if electrolytes are also lost oral supplementation or iv saline infusion that is Uh, infusion of sodium chloride so next we will look at water intoxication which is also known as overhydration or expansion right so mainly retention of water will lead to three cases just like the previous one isotonic expansion it can be hypotonic or it can be hypertonic so let's understand the physiology of each of them so isotonic means both water and solute will be over corrected so what can happen due to secondary to hypertension and cardiac failure it can be due to secondary hyperaldosteronism and one very important hypoalbuminemia due to nephrotic syndrome and protein malnutrition just as i told you in case of dehydration these each uh, physiology i mean each phenomena have got very interesting physiology by which you can understand the detail mechanism but as a first year student definitely you don't need to know just remember also in case of mcq just remember these clinical uh, causes and they will help you to answer any <laughs> question next we look at hypotonic expansion predominant water excess right hypotonic means solutes are low so what are the causes glomerular dysfunction and increased adh 
what happens high ECA volume inhibits aldosterone and that leads to hyponatremia and low osmolality persists okay next hypertonic expansion it means retention of sodium so expansion but electrolyte is more compared to water so what will happen high plasma osmolality that will lead to secretion of ADH and osmolality will be restored next high aldosterone will lead to sodium retention associated hypokalemia if there is hypokalemia it will also lead to metabolic alkalosis however the danger of hypertonic expansion is cerebral edema coma patient undergoes coma due to accumulation of brain cells brain gets swollen the nucleus of brain various important nucleus and respiratory centers get pushed against the skull and they can lead to death so cerebral cellular overhydration can lead to coma and death so at a glance we can compare and see all the cases of uh, contraction as well as expansion so expansion of ecf isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic and contraction isotonic hypotonic and hypertonic we can look at the biochemical features we can look at the osmolality hematocrit value you can choose to ignore but it's very easy to remember that uh, hematocrit will be always low in case of expansion hematocrit means number of uh, the packed cell volume compared to the whole blood so if blood is diluted hematocrit will be low however hematocrit will be very high in case of dehydration what is most important is value of plasma now this is sodium now this is very easy to understand whenever it's isotonic it will be normal whenever it is hypotonic it will be low this is wrongly written and whenever there is hypertonic uh, contraction or expansion it will be high <laughs> okay so these are the basic biochemical features which i have just discussed and i'm not gonna <laughs> repeat it twice so how this thing is controlled okay we have already discussed again let us go through them one by one extracellular osmolality what will happen thirst and adh they act to thirst and adh what will happen water intake reabsorption of water from kidney okay in case of hypovolemia it will lead to stimulation of thirst and adh it will stimulate aldosterone and they will lead to thirst will lead to retention of water and aldosterone will lead to retention of sodium now what will happen if there is an expansion in ecf it will inhibit aldosterone and it will lead to negative reabsorption of sodium that is excretion of sodium and in case of hypoosmolality it will inhibit adh secretion and it will lead to negative reabsorption of water remember hypoosmolality means hemodilution so we need to excrete more and more water so <laughs> emphasis is towards the negative sign that indicates prevents okay so finally what are the laboratory tests in order to assess this fluid and electrolyte status because at the end of the day neither patient nor you will be directly looking into his body or her body and be understanding the physiology these are all back calculation from the laboratory reports because as a physician we should always uh, find the evidence first then judge so the laboratory tests that are important in this regard is sodium potassium chloride plasma osmolality urea creatinine urinary electrolytes that is sodium potassium excretion and hematocrit value now what is this a uh, freezing pt depress it's actually the phenomenon of freezing point depression you know a uh, high osmolar fluid will have a lowered freezing point so we actually can directly test osmolality using this freezing point depression <laughs> test so one slide about urine electrolytes i told you this is very important and we routinely measure urine electrolytes along with plasma electrolytes because they are very useful in determining any cause of electrolyte disorder must interpret in light of volume of status and serum potassium of patient it means isolated analysis of these have got no value they should always be analyzed in correlation with the total volume of patient as well as the serum potassium of the patient now random urine 
is usually adequate in calculating fractional excretion or TTKG that is trans tubular potassium gradient. We don't need to collect 24 hour urine. However, when we are actually looking into the volume of urine output, 24 hour urine collection is a must. So, next two slides will be discussing sodium excretion and potassium excretion. So, this will be discussed in more details when we go to electrolyte imbalance. So, in extra renal sodium loss, 99% is already reabsorbed. However, with tubular damage, diuretics, adrenal insufficiency and volume overload, fractional excretion of sodium often increases more than 5% and this is the formula of fractional excretion of sodium only for PG students and need PG preparing candidates. So, urinary sodium multiplied by plasma creatinine divided by plasma sodium multiplied by urinary creatinine multiplied by 100 this gives you the fractional excretion of sodium and lastly potassium excretion so generally in extranal potassium loss maximum reabsorbed is approximately 85 to 90 percent however potassium losses is best described as ttkg that is trans tubular potassium gradient and what is the formula of this it's urinary potassium multiplied by plasma osmolality divided by plasma so potassium multiplied by urine osmolality generally trans tubular potassium gradient more than 8 it means there is loss of potassium and trans tubular potassium gradient less than 2 means there is retention of potassium so we come to the end of this exhaustive lecture on water imbalance and we have discussed a bit of electrolyte imbalance we will be continuing with electrolyte imbalance in our future class however if you have attended really attended my lecture till now you should enter the keyword balance in the comment section and i will know that you have watched this video and you are interested in watching my future lecture class on electrolyte imbalance as well i thank you all for your patient hearing and i will see you soon with another video till then bye and take care